church today. Audrey had, uh, Audrey had knee surgery. Yeah, amen. Audrey had some knee surgery a number of weeks ago, and so she's been rehabbing and just kind of staying at home and laying low, and so, but it's great to see you. And also, Jake, I, I noticed you're here as well, and, and we just love you, man, and it's great to see you in church, and I'm just kind of spreading the love this morning. So let's just uh, welcome Jake as well. And and, uh, and if you don't feel welcome, I pray that you would feel welcome. Again, if you're visiting with us, we just uh, want to extend the right hand of fellowship, and uh, that's what we're all about. We're um, a welcoming, friendly church, and we're just glad that you could uh, take some time out of your Sunday and be a part of, uh, you know, be with us this morning as we, as we kind of um, move our way toward the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to uh, dismiss all the children. Our DIG program is starting right now. So you may go to your DIG program. Be dismissed. Praise the Lord. I believe it's ages 4 to 6 and then 7 to 11. Amen. And as they're on their way out, now that I think most of them are gone, so we don't create an issue in the aisles, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. We're going to receive tithes and offerings this morning. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving to the work of the Lord. Um, we have lots of amazing plans to connect with our community coming up. And so, um, you know, your, your giving, we're going to just attach that to the mission of our church. And we believe that God has some great plans and a great future for our church. And so we, uh, we do need uh, money to do that. So God bless you. And I know you've, you guys are so faithful. But let's uh, pray. God, once again, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us, Lord. You've provided for our every need as we give back to you. Lord, what is yours? Bless it, God. Multiply it. Use it, Lord, to glorify yourself. Use it to touch the hearts and lives of so many people in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you as you give. A couple of announcements I'll give um, uh, just off the top here. Number one is there is a women's conference coming up. Actually, there's two women's conferences, and I actually am hesitating to um, announce both of them because I think you'll get confused, because I know I would. So uh, there's one coming up in Jan it's January the 30th. And for that one, that's called No Boys Allowed. That's our a district women's conference. And so for that, I'm just going to funnel you straight through to Lucy Link. And uh, she has all the info. It's called No Boys Allowed. And it's uh, about how do I get out of the pit? So if you're feeling like you're in some kind of pit, if you're feeling like there's some despair, some de depression or whatever, I'm sure you can get you know, a lot of love, encouragement, support, truth, all of those things at this conference. So see Lucy after. Um, and then just put this mental note in your mind. Um, we have some brochures about another women's conference that's coming up. And I can't remember her last name, Moira from uh, 100 Huntley Street. Brown, Moira Brown. She is doing a conference, it's actually in Brantford, and that's in March. So just put that mental note, and there's some brochures out just uh, right by the debit machine, and um, you can check that out after service. It's, um, it's called One Heart, One Way, and I gotta be honest, I don't really know a whole lot about it, but there are brochures, so you can go out and check that out on the table. Um, Really excited about what's happening next week at our church. Um, I'm calling the church to a week of fasting and prayer. And uh, so this is going to be from basically from tomorrow morning uh, all the way through to next Saturday night. So one full week or um, yeah, one full week uh, with a specific church, all church prayer night, 7 p.m. Thursday here in the sanctuary. So you're all invited. This is not like, you know, a prayer group. It's just like, let's all come together. And instead of having church and having a message and some worship, we'll have a little bit of worship and maybe a little bit of teaching and some leading and stuff, but let's get together and let's intercede for our church in the upcoming year. Amen? And so, uh, but also on your, in your own personal journey, in your own personal growth and curve uh, for your own life, um, I know that we kind of put a little bug in your ear last week to be thinking about something that you want to fast this week. You could fast meals, you could fast the entire week. If you were, you know, if you were that committed, you could do that. Fast three days, fast one day. You could fast something like coffee, like TV, like technology, Facebook. Facebook would be a good fast for some people. Um, you know, you, so you, but that's something that you need to decide. Uh, it's between you and the Lord. And so you need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to the place of the thing that you need to, uh, to fast through. And so, um, but I encourage every single person in this room to fast something. 
I'm encouraging you all to fast something. Ask God to do something uh, incredible in your life uh, in the coming year ahead. And also to ask God to do something incredible in our church in the year ahead. And also ask God to do something incredible in our community in the year ahead. So those are the three things, right? Pretty, pretty easy, content, concentric circles. I love uh, the book of Joshua. And this is not my message, but I love the book of Joshua. And, and in the book of Joshua, when they're ready to cross the, into the promised land, God says this incredible thing. And I just, I just love the way this comes out. And I just love what it says and what it means. And, and so God says to Joshua, Here's what you say to the people. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do some amazing things among you. Right? Consecrate yourselves, and that's a big fancy church word that just basically means set, your, set yourself aside. Set yourself apart for something special. Consecrate yourselves. And that's what we're going to do with the week of fasting. We're going to set ourselves apart. We're going to fast something, and we're going to seek the Lord. And then we're going to pray this prayer that the Lord will do some amazing things among us in our church and in our community and in our hearts and lives. Amen? Is that good? I'm just really looking forward to that. And so I'm going to uh, throw to a video here, So, um, and then I want to tell you about some small groups. So some people think these people actually come to our church. They don't, but watch this video. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tommy. And I'm Eddie. And we're the Skit Guys. We want to encourage you to sign up for community groups. Uh, I think it means Sunday school classes. Well, some may call them that, but they're really just small groups that meet. That is true. Mm -hmm. That is true. Mm -hmm. I heard of a church one time that called them life groups. Oh, oh, um, I have a friend that calls them connect groups. Well, my aunt's church actually calls them cell groups. Okay, okay. My, my brother's cousin, once removed, no, no, twice removed, he calls them growth groups. Well, I heard that the guy who invented toaster strudel, his church calls them family groups. Oh, yeah? Well, I was watching YouTube once, and this, um, this dachshund was barking, and the dog that was barking made the sound, and the sound that it made sounded like the dog was saying home groups. No. Yes. No. Yes. Show me. Tr what? Show me what it was like. Um, the dog, okay, it was like, home groups, home. Was the dog named Bill Cosby? <laughs> what? That sounded no, just like it did not. Oh, it sounded like a dachshund watching watch YouTube. It sounded like a dachshund watching two YouTube here in home groups. Anyway, no matter what you call it, sign up. Yeah, there's nothing better than being a part of community and doing life together at church. How many churches call these groups food groups? I don't know, but if I was in a food group, I'd want to be in chocolate. It's not a food group. Yeah, and these aren't all Sunday school classes. Ah, a little bit of humor there for Sunday morning. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the deal. Uh, we have this goal that we'd like everybody, or we'd like, we'd like everybody, but we're setting a goal for 80% of our church to be involved in some home groups or sm cell groups or small groups or growth groups or connect groups, whatever. We call them small groups. Um, but uh, we want uh, people to be in the process of growing in their lives in Christ. And so we have done some great work over the last couple of weeks and months uh, to put together, we have seven different groups. And I'm really uh, super excited about these groups that we have, and I'm going to give just a bit of an overview on each one, but the, uh, the deal is sign up for these groups uh, on the way out of church. Um, as soon as we're done the service here, you can sign up for these groups and get involved with some of these groups, and you can sign up just outside on the table. You probably saw that table on your way in. So here's, um, I'm going to go through in chronological order. So we have one every night of the week. Is that cool or what? I think that's really good. Okay, so even if you don't, I do. Um, so number one group is this, and it's called Crazy Love, and the subheading would be Overwhelmed by a Relentless God, and this is going to be led uh, and hosted by Vern and Lucy Link, and so that's on Mondays, and uh, it's at 7 p.m. It starts Monday, February 2nd. Uh, this book will challenge your faith, and you'll grow. I believe it's a 10-week course, and uh, it will challenge you to, uh, to just to grow in God. And so I, I, know the, I know the material, and I know Lucy and Vern are great leaders and great hosts. So you'll be safe there, and uh, you'll be challenged there, and you'll grow there. So that's the first one. And then Tuesday night, Ryan Hernsich is actually leading a young adult small group. 
So if you have any people in your life that you, uh, you know, consider young adults or whatever, and they maybe have some questions or whatever, funnel them Ryan's way, and he's going to be, I know he's going to, plans to get together with uh, Pastor Dan and with uh, my son Taylor and uh, and try and build something uh, for young adults and minister to the needs of young adults. So that's Tuesdays at 7 p.m., and uh, that starts this Tuesday, right? Uh, uh, I was going to say February, January 24th, and uh, the address and everything is outside for you. Um, And then I'm really excited about this one. We have two small groups that are more connected to the community than they are specifically for just serving the needs and and, um, requirements of the church. And so Diane Elms, who's sitting right over here in the orange shirt, um, she is going to run a course, um, a small group course, and it's six weeks, six weeks long, financial health. And so if there's anybody in your life or in your, um, you know, immediate circle who they're, maybe they're struggling financially, they can't, you know, they're just really having a whole lot of trouble. And, and I've run a couple of these groups myself. I know that seven out of 10 people live paycheck to paycheck and it doesn't matter how much money they make. They could, they could make six figures. They still live paycheck to paycheck because they're, you know, living beyond their means. And so Diane has some, uh, some training in finances and she has some uh, course material that she's going to kind of modify, and then six weeks, uh, hopefully it'll be a, a, a financial makeover, and it will help you be a better steward of the resources that God gives. And so I'm just really excited about that. I know it's been in the paper, and, and, uh, and we're just praying that there will be a number of people from outside the church. So this is not, this would be biblically based, but it's not a Bible study, right? So if you have some friends who, again, you've had some really heart-to-heart conversations and they just don't know what to do, don't know where to turn, and all of that kind of stuff, this might be uh, the best fit for them. So uh, I would just send you to Diane. You can talk to her after church. You can sign up outside as well on the... um on the table. Uh, and then I'm running a course that I'm really excited about as well. It's called Deep and Wide. And uh, here's the sub uh, heading for this. I would consider this a church leadership type small group, um, but I'm throwing it out to anybody who wants to be involved. And the subheading is this Creating churches unchurched people love to attend. And so this is all about um, who we want to be, um, who we want to be as a, as a church, and how we want to do our best to reach, um, reach our community and reach other people for Jesus, to be a place when, when people come through these doors, they, they, they feel, like we've been talking about over the last number of weeks, grace and truth. Uh, that's what Jesus was all about. He was the full embodiment of grace and truth, and so we want to do that. We want to create our church. We don't want it to just be routine and rote and just kind of go through, do what we've always done, all of that kind of stuff. We want to constantly be challenging ourselves to be the kind of church that unchurched people would love to attend. So that's Thursday nights at 7. It starts February 5th. Um, and then also, um, George Eves, uh, who's right down here, this distinguished gentleman, who uh, I believe, he, he really looks like if Jesus lived longer than 33 years of age, I think he would look just like George Eves. That's what I think. <laughs> So it's, it's really cool, except, you know, George doesn't wear the tunic, which I'm happy about. But um, George is right down here, and George is linked up with Rennie Romkis, and, uh, and they're going to run a small group, and we uh, believe it's going to be hosted at Rennie's, uh, Rennie's home. And so George, if you know him, um, he's a gentle soul with a great heart for God and a lot of maturity. Um, he's been through the ringer a few times and has a lot of experience to, uh, to offer, and will be able to lead you um, into a deeper faith in Christ. So you can talk to George after, um, after our uh, after service today or just sign up. We also have an ongoing uh, small group prayer group, and we'd like this to be a large group, but right now it's a small group, and we're happy with the number of people that come every Friday morning, and we hold down the needs of our, of our church in prayer. And so you get prayed for on a regular basis. We pray for all the, you know, anybody who's sick or going through something or operations, we, we cover them. And so it's, it's pretty informal. We usually have a good time of conversation, and then we have a great time of prayer as well. And so you're all uh, welcome to come to that. If you um, aren't doing anything, that's Friday mornings at 8.30. And then the last one, and I'm actually so, so excited about this, um, is more, again, of a community-based group. And uh, if I said the word celebrate recovery, how many people would know what I'm saying? 
Okay, so a bunch of people would know. So a lot of people have issues in our church, a lot of people in Pentecostal circles especially, would have issues with uh, 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous because they don't uh, define the Lord or the higher power as Jesus. And so, so we have fought all those battles. And then one of the good things that has come out of all of those battles is Celebrate Recovery. So this is out of Saddleba Saddleback Church. Rick Warren has a, a good hand in all of this. This is, a, this is a 12 step program that has Jesus Christ as the central figure. And so here's the tagline for it it's a Christ centered recovery program for any hurt, hang up, or habit. And I love that. I think that's just so awesome because sometimes you're not completely addicted to something, but sometimes you do. You have some past hurts or you have a hang-up and you just want to kind of get over it. Um, you want some help. You want some encouragement. You want some community. You want to have some conversation about it. You don't have a safe place to go. This is the place to go. And so if you have people in your life that you would like to direct this way, and this is a great triumvirate of leaders. So my wife, Carolyn Sharp, um, Sarah Keysmat, I don't know if you've had a chance to meet her, and then Julia Hilton, who's just gone through and got her schooling uh, in uh, addictions counseling and all that kind of stuff. So you're in real, real capable hands with those leaders. Um, and uh, yeah, so we are going to advertise that in the community. It's going to take a few weeks or months to get it kind of up and running. But if you're interested, if you want to be involved, if you know some people that need to be involved, we're going to start the ball rolling. So we're just going to kind of, you know, follow our nose on this and let the leading of the Lord lead us to where he wants. But we believe that this is going to be such an impactful thing in our community. Amen? And uh, there's how many people do we know that are addicted to stuff or just, you know, need deliverance. They need that environment of healing, health, wholeness, you know, support, encouragement, um, you know, community. And so we want to be a church that provides stuff like that. And so I'm so, so thrilled that we can do that. So I think it's a great bouquet, if I could say. It's a great buffet of, uh, of small groups. So there's stuff for leaders, stuff for you know, younger Christians, stuff for people who aren't even in the church. And uh, I'm super, super excited about all of the things that God is going to do. So uh, join a small group. That's the, that's the bottom line. So we have seven of them there. And hey, you know what? If you don't see one there that you like and you would like to start one, then come and talk to me. And uh, we would, you know, we'd be totally open to that because we believe that that's the direction that our church needs to go. All right? Okay, so um, here is um, where we left off. We're in the middle of a series, and it's called What's Next? What's next? And we're asking this question as we launch into the brand new year. And uh, we've had some great conversations. Um, I know some great conversations. Actually, we had a great conversation beyond the sermon small group on Thursday night. It was, I, I thought it was one of our better small groups. And we just had a really good conversation talking about last week, which was building bridges. But week one was all about this... Um, sort of the context of what we need to be about. And we're hanging the context on the verse from Hebrews 12, 1 and 3, which says, you know, let us drop or let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, right? So we need to be about getting rid of anything that's going to hold us back as people or as a church. We need to run with perseverance. And some, that's so hard. It's so hard to get started running. It's so hard to keep running when you get started. Uh, but we need to uh, run with perseverance. And it has to be the race that's marked out for us. Again, we talked about the fact we're not supposed to run somebody else's race. We're running our own race. And then we fix, we focus, we laser, pinpoint accuracy onto the eyes of Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of, uh, perfecter of our faith. We ask the question at the end, um, are you up for what's next? Are you up for what's next? Uh, no status quo in the Christian life. Are you up for what's next? Um, God has some plans for you as a person. God has some plans for us as a church. God has some plans for us to impact the community. Are you up for what's next? And so it's basically a challenge. Um, and then last week we talked about this whole royal priesthood thing and the fact that it means being a bridge builder. And we understood that as a church, as a people, as individual people, we are responsible to build bridges. We're responsible to build bridges. If you're in the church, if you call, if you name the name of Christ, then you're responsible to build bridges. And so often in our past, churches have been better at building walls than building bridges. We have to be about building bridges to our community. And I love the C.S. Lewis quote. We alluded to this, and it said, the church is the only organization that exists primarily for its non-members. 
And we need to be about that. And so oftentimes the church can be a bless me club and a club that just wants to kind of please itself and and be okay with each other and love one another, mutual admiration society, all of that kind of stuff. A friend of mine said this quote, and we also talked about this last week. Uh, The thrust of scripture and the movement of the gospel is outward. So if you believe in the gospel, if you believe in the fact that, you know, you know that Jesus Christ came to earth, died for your sins, and if you put your faith and hope in him, if you believe in him, you will have everlasting life, right? That's what the Bible says. But that whole mandate, that whole mission um, of Jesus is an outward thrust. It's not, it's not internal. And so, and then we talked about the fact that at the end of all this, you know, we got to be about building bridges, but at the end of all this, you may only get one chance. You may only, if, if, you know, at our church, uh, people may come through these doors that are addicted, that are hurting, that have hang-ups, that have habits, that have all of those things, and we need to be the representation of grace and truth to those people, and no pressure or anything, we may only get one chance to build that bridge. And so we have to do our utmost to, to connect with those people, to build that bridge, and to uh, bring them to, um, to the place where they know, know God. So that's a bit of a review. And then today, uh, we're going to be talking about growing in God. And then the sermon title in the bulletin is Don't Grow It Alone. So we're going to be talking about how we have to grow together. And we'll get to that near the end. But let me tell you a story to begin my, uh, my sermon, and it's actually kind of an anniversary. I find sometimes when God gives you, excuse me, when God gives you um, you know, stories or illustrations or thoughts on what you're supposed to be speaking of. They're always kind of like there's these odd connections. And so I remember meeting uh, this a friend of mine named Derek. Uh, I remember meeting him at a Super Bowl party if you can believe it. So the Super Bowl party was at my last church, Innisfil Community Church, and so we're there and, and got a big screen and there's all these chairs and there's chili as far as the eye can see and nachos and, and, and everything. And, you know, so as a pastor, I'm there and I, you know, I love football. Like, I'm really excited about today. Anybody excited about today? Any, okay, all right. Okay, so focus. Okay, so... I just love football. And so when I watch a football game, usually I like to just watch the game. I know John and I have had this conversation. Like, don't, don't talk to me. This isn't like social time. But so it's, it's kind of like the worst of both worlds when you get to watch the football game, but you're the pastor at the church where the football game is being played and people are having conversations. So you kind of have to just kind of go, okay, what's more important? And decide, you know, hey, you know what? The, the social interaction is way more important than the, you know, stupid football game. So, but I was enjoying the football game and I'm watching this football game. And so there's this, um, there's this young man that I met that night, and his name is Derek. His name is Derek. And, and Derek is, is the shyest, quietest, uh, meekest, humblest person you've ever met in your life. Like, I would challenge any of you to tell me about the person, and we could stack them up side by side like Derek. Like, he just wouldn't say a word. He just, he just wouldn't talk. So, I'm, I'm, so I, of course, I'm a pastor, and I'm kind of like, I want to connect with you. So I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? And, you know, and Rob, and, you know, and how's the football game? He's like, yeah, yeah. Like, just <laughs> wouldn't say a word. It just, like, so, so, so quiet and uh, painfully shy. And so I tried to connect with him, and I thought, oh, my gosh, like, this guy is just, he's, we, just not going to happen. So, uh, so then we watched the game and finished, and we're cleaning up afterwards, and he's lingering around. And I had never met this guy before, so I'm like, what, what's this guy, you know, lingering around for? And so, uh, so we're cleaning up, and we had a whole audio set up, and all these pick, uh, speakers, we have these massive community speakers. I think Dan Lupos probably has the most miles of lifting these massive community speakers. And, and so we used to have a youth room that was up about a, you know, 16 flight staircase. And so you have to bring these, uh, you know, 200 pound speakers back up to the youth room. It was just insane. But the things you do for love, right? So, um, so, uh, so I said to Derek, I'm like, hey man, grab the end of that speaker. <laughs> right? And so if you knew Derek as well, he's like this big around, right? Like he's so shy and so slight. So however, uh, so he grabs the end of the speaker and we lug this speaker up to the youth room and we're, you know, sweating as we go up and then we go down and get the other speaker and he, you know, and so it's just kind of like trying to connect and I know he's not going to talk, so why don't we lift stuff? So we, you know, so we, we put away a bunch more things and, and, uh, and whatever and we, we said goodnight and goodbye and, and uh, so then, you know, over the course of the time that I was there, 
I know he, he was connected already to the youth pastor that was there. And then we got a new youth pastor and he connected and, and he just kept hanging around. He just kept like staying uh, close to the church and attended the youth group and got connected to some of the people in the youth group and built some friendships there. And, uh, and then there was a time when I was running... Um, and did all the audio, and we had a lighting board and a sound desk and a computer, uh, you know, computer station and stuff. And so I said, hey, would you, would you be interested in helping me run the lights? And so he's like, yeah, I, I would really, be, you know, because he's a real technical guy, loves video games and all that stuff. And so uh, we have this lighting console, and it's all computerized and everything. So we put him down, gave him some training, and then he took off and started to work this lighting board. So for all of our services and all that stuff, he was running this entire, so I thought, you know, this, that's a win. And, and he's, you know, we're starting to have a little bit of rapport, and he's starting to have a a little bit of rapport with more, you know, more people, and then growing in the youth group and getting some friends in the youth group, and they're going over to his house, and he's coming over to their house, and um, and so then two years ago, and I've talked about this quite a bit, we had a missions trip to Colombia. So Derek signs up for the missions trip, and I'm like, wow, well this is like this is this is significant growth. You know, you want to go to another country? Like, this is, like, I didn't know that you could start a conversation, <laughs> you know? And so, but he, he, like, he's all in. And so part of the, you know, the training for going away on this, on this mission trip was everybody had to do their personal testimony. And everybody at some point along the way in the mission trip, maybe two, three times, you're going to be called upon to do your, your, um, to do your personal testimony. And so I was like, ah, oh, it's going to be interesting. This is really going to be interesting. And so over the course of his discipling and stuff, he got really deeply theological. And so I thought this is really going to be interesting. And so it was amazing uh, to watch him. From this kid who, uh, you know, in meeting him, just wouldn't say boo to anyone. All of a sudden now, standing up in front of a peer in a team that planning to go spread the gospel in a brand, a whole other country, on a whole other continent, and standing up there and, and watching him deliver his, 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 uh, his testimony. And I got to tell you, it wasn't great. It wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, you know, it wasn't amazing. But in him doing that process, he talked about how he had some learning disabilities. And he talked about his home life, which got us a little window into the life of Derek. And he talked about, um, you know, being in a car accident as a, a young kid, and that also causing some issues with both his parents and being on disability and, and, and then hit himself as well. And then he talked about being bullied, and I'm thinking, this guy is bearing his soul. You know, from a person who honestly wouldn't say boo to anyone, all of a sudden he's bearing his soul. And so I remember taking him aside and just going, you know, like, you know, you, when we get to Columbia, you're, like, you're going to be in front of a bunch of students. Like, we had six, seven, eight hundred people in an auditorium. And, and okay, Derek, it's, it's, it's go time. And I'm just picturing this guy just shutting down. Like, I can't do this. You know, I, I won't be able to do this. And so, long story short, or long story, just long, it... It blew me away when I watched him as a 20-year-old person, 21 or whatever he is, stand in a different country with a translator in front of teenagers and tell them, guys, you're going to get through. I found Jesus. I found Jesus. I found this community called the church and the community called the church invited me in. And took me from being bullied and disability and, and uh, you know, car accident and all the traumas that my life brought me. And I, I found my way to this place where all of a sudden, as a human being, I could reach and achieve my potential. And it's not just this human potential. All of a sudden, spiritually, I'm, I'm literally spanning the globe to tell the story of what God has done in my life. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm just sitting there, and I know our whole team, we were there, and we're just like looking at him, just like, you know, this is amazing. And so there was one night, and I'll just add this on the end, where we were, it was martial law, and you guys have heard some of the stories that went on in Colombia. Don't go to Colombia on a missions trip, or maybe do, but just, yeah, be careful. I don't know. However, we were martial law, and it was just me and Derek. We went to this church service, and it was kind of this underground church service, dirt floor, you know, steel, you know, walls and stuff, no PA system, you know, basically lawn chairs, right? And it was like, okay, this is church. Very interesting. But Derek gave his testimony. We were talking about sharing your faith, how to share your faith. 
And I got up, and, and in the meanwhile, he, um, he said he had lost his papers. So there, Derek got up and gave his testimony without any papers or any prodding whatsoever. And I, I just pointed to him, and I just go, you know, if this guy, if this guy can do this, there's no reason on earth that anybody couldn't do what he's doing. It truly is amazing what God can do in the life of a human being. Isn't it? How many people can attest to that? It's so amazing what God can do in the life of a human being. When you place your life in God's hands. When you place your life in God's hands. And so to kind of upset the apple cart and to kind of challenge everybody this morning, I want to ask you a question. And I want you just to ask this, and I don't want you to be offended at me, and I don't want you to be mad at me. I want you just to consider this, and I want you to let the Spirit of God lead you in the question. My question to you is, have you stopped growing in God? Have you plateaued? Have you come to a ceiling point, and and you may have been there for five years, ten years, twenty years? 30 years, there has been little or no signs of growth. The, 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 the growing in God in your relationship with Him has been so put on the back burner that you can't even remember when the last time it was when you learned something new or had something fresh or had a fresh touch from God and God led you to that new place. Are, are, as a church, are we lacking spiritual appetite for the things of God? Are we lacking spiritual appetite? Do we have a desire for God anymore at all? Do we, do we lack true growth in our spiritual lives? And do we lack the fruit and the evidence of actually growing in God? The question that I just kind of came up with myself as I was preparing for this is maybe the church, you know, we talked about the church not growing and stuff. Maybe the church has stopped growing because Christians have stopped growing. And I, and I don't want you to be offended and these questions might be unfair and these questions might you know, rub you the wrong way or, or whatever. But these are questions I think if we wrestle with, I think there's, I think there's some beauty. I think there's some success. I think there's, there's, um, there's wins on the other end of these questions. Maybe the church has stopped growing because we as believers, we don't have an appetite for God anymore. And how do we expect the world to have an appetite for God? How do we expect the world to have this mind-blowing experience if God, for us, is, is just a meh experience? We're just kind of like, yeah, I go to church. And I believe that there is, just like in Derek's life, there's this place of growth that I believe that we can all, if we lend our hands, if we, if we give our hands to the plow, if we put our effort into it, there is a place where we're going to bear much fruit. And it's not just going to be, you know, fruit, oh, new people have come to the church. No, no, no. It's going to be in your life. And all of a sudden, God, that, that fire of God inside of you is going to crackle again with brand new life. And there's going to be heat coming off it. And it won't be contained. And I don't know about you, but maybe I'm not quite there. I I feel like God is, but I want to be there. I want to be in a place where, where, where the life in God is just coming in waves, where growth in God is coming in waves. And I believe if that starts to happen in our lives, if that starts to happen in our lives individually as people, oh my goodness, the walls will not contain that kind of growth. Right? And so I want to be about that. I want to be about that. So let me, I mean, I feel like I can almost close right now. I'm not going to because I get paid by the word. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. Okay, so I want, I want to bring a story. And, and God led me to this story. I was telling Carolyn earlier on. I love the verse in the Bible. I know, Rachel, we've chatted about this verse. Where in the Bible, it talks about Jesus. If you look it up, uh, Luke 2.40 and then Luke 2.52, you can look it up. And there's, there's, I, I just, there's a bunch of connections. But it says that Jesus grew. Okay, we're talking about growth. Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Right? So I don't know about you, but that's, that's a great prayer. God, help me to grow in wisdom and stature. And, you know, not this way, but this way. Um, wisdom, stature, and favor with God. And man, that's a prayer for my life. And so I was kind of, I was trying to, you know, think of verses and stuff that would be appropriate today. And then I realized that there is actually a biblical precedent for that prayer, for that statement that Luke made in Luke 2.40, Luke 2.52, um, 
There's precedent for that. And here's where I found it. I found it in the book of 1 Samuel. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to read you a story. And it's not even going to be on PowerPoint. You can go there if you want. Uh, 1 Samuel 2. And uh, I believe that this story could make a great... John, if you want to kind of go down the road of another series, another TV series, you know, Game of, Th- Game of Thrones or, you know, some of these series that are all kind of like, you know, I, I look at some of these series and, and they're kind of like, everybody's like, wow, these are really controversial. And I'm like, have you ever read the Bible? Like, <laughs> right? Like some of the stories in the Bible would literally curl your hair. So listen to this story and, and, and remember the context of spiritual growth and the fact that we all should be in the place of spiritual growth. We're going to look at the example of of Samuel. I'm picking it up in verse 12 if you're reading along with me. I'm in the New Living Translation. It says this, now the sons of Eli were scoundrels. Okay, New Living Translation. I love that. Sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Like, I could stop right there, right? We have duties as priests. We learned that last week. We are a royal priesthood. We're supposed to be building bridges. We're supposed to be serving the Lord and serving other people. And so these guys, the sons of Eli, were scoundrels, had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. So I hope we're not in this camp. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, get this, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork, And while the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever it brought up be given to Eli's sons. Now you have to go through Levitical law and uh, Jewish customs and uh, the temple and all kinds of things to realize how unacceptable this is before the, before the Lord, how, how sinful this practice is. And we don't have time to go into it, but you can just understand that these guys are just really, really not respecting God. In fact, the other way, they're doing things that are just completely dishonoring God. These kids who've been brought up in the church, these kids who are priests themselves, are not serving God in his house. And in fact, they're causing people to do sinful things. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. So it's kind of like across the board, they were just mismanaging their position in the church. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar and he would demand raw meat before it had been broiled so that it could be used for roasting. Uh, Again, kind of going down the road of my needs are more important than the sacrifice that we're going to offer to God. And so I want to make a roast beef out of your sacrifice. And so my needs for my taste buds and my appetites, they're more important than anything that you could offer to God. The man, uh, the man offering the sacrifice might reply, take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. Again, according to Levitical law, then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now or I'll take it by force. So the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight. And they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. Horrible stuff. We've all seen horrible stuff go on in churches. We talked about that a few weeks ago. But Samuel. But Samuel. Now for those of you who don't understand the story of Samuel or need a little bit of a refresher, you know, uh, there was this woman named Hannah and she was, um, there was a guy named El- Elkina and he had two wives and Hannah could not have a, a, a you know, baby but the other wife could have a baby and uh, it's great to see a baby in church, I just have to say. Uh, that's awesome. Um, so, but, so, but Hannah couldn't get pregnant and so she cries out to God, oh God, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you and I will dedicate and consecrate him. He will be... He will serve you forever. And so that's, that became Samuel. So God honored the prayer. The baby came. And then uh, Hannah brings uh, Samuel back to the church when he's of age. And then Samuel, this kid, who basically is a foster kid or a, you know, an orphan kid, you know, kind of brought up in the church. But, but probably not the, the future. She just wanted to have a baby so bad. And she had a few babies after that. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. 
Though he was only a boy, he served the Lord. And I love this. I get this picture, kind of like those Precious Moments dolls. It says this. He says, he wore a linen garment like that of a priest. And so you can picture this little boy with this, you know, remember when you were hockey? And you, like for me, I was smaller. And so you would get this adult jersey, and right? And you'd be out on the ice and like the, I remember Taylor, you were like this too. Uh, so, you know, the, the you know, the, uh, Jersey would be like down to your knees, right? And you'd be kind of skating along. It would look like you were in a dress. And I kind of picture Samuel being like that, where he's got this priestly robe on, but he's just a boy. But it says that he served the Lord. And I love this. Get the idea of growth here. Some of you moms will pick up on this. It says, each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came her, um, with her husband for the sacrifice. So every year they would come up and they would bring their sacrifice and mom would knit him a new coat, put together a new coat because he'd get a little, that little much taller, right? He grew in stature. And so... Um, so uh, it says in verse 20, it says, Before they returned home, Eli, who was the actual priest, would, b- would bless Elkanah, Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one um, she gave, uh, that she gave to the Lord. And the Lord gave Hannah three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So stay with me. Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli who's the priest. He's the big head honcho. Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people. And he knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Right? Like these guys are just scoundrels, as the Bible says. They're doing everything the wrong way. They were brought up in the church. And it's not that they're not growing. They're actually going backwards. And it's not that they're just going backwards. They're taking other people with them. Like, this is, dev- this is a devastating picture of what can happen inside the church. Eli said to them, I have been um, hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things that you were doing. Why do you keep on sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? It's kind of like, you guys are way beyond where you should be. You guys are way, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that anybody in our church is in that kind of sinful lifestyle. But it just does point out that there's two people that are offered this opportunity to be in the church, one to grow. Samuel is the one who has this life of growth, and we're going to see it in just a second. And then these other two that have every opportunity to grow in God, and to find the truth of God and the presence of God, they have that opportunity and they go the complete opposite way. But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father for the Lord was already planning uh, to put them to death. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel, get this, again, it mentions it, and I so appreciate the Lord leading us to this scripture, but it says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew favor with the Lord and with the people. And that's the precedent for Jesus. And I just think, man, if you're Samuel and they're mentioning you thousand years later, 1,200 years later, that Samuel was the one that grew taller in favor with uh, the Lord and with the people. And then Jesus, they said the exact same thing. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The example, here's, here's my point, is the example, the example of Samuel's growth was, to, was a model for the future. So let me just read a little bit further. One day a man of God came to Eli and gave a message to the Lord. I revealed myself to your ancestors when the people of Israel um, were slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron uh, from all, among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, to wear the priestly vest, which, remember, um, Samuel was wearing. He served me. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to you priests. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? For you and they have become fat from the best offerings of my people. Therefore, the Lord, God of Israel, says, I promise that you, that your branch of the tribe of Levi, who were all the priests, would always be my priests, but I will honor those who honor me, and I will despise those who think lightly of me. 
There's some dangerous ground here, church. If we come to the place of God and we take lightly our growth in him, if we take lightly our development, our discipleship, we're supposed to be disciples of Christ. If we take that lightly, there's literally a curse that is associated with that. Maybe that's a strong word. But, but God says, I will despise. I will despise. God's God of love. I will despise those who think lightly of me. And the time is coming when I will put an end to your family so it will no longer serve as my priests. And all the members of your family will die before their time. None will reach old age. You will watch with envy as I pour out prosperity on all the people of Israel, but no members of your family will ever live out their days. Those who survive will live in sadness and grief. Like, don't get on God's bad side, okay? Just don't get on God's side. I think that's the moral of the story in this little portion. Don't get on God's bad side. It says sadness and grief, and their children will die a violent death. And to prove that what I have said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, They probably got teased by those two names. I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Which if you read on further in chapter 4, they do. They die, they go to a battle, and they both die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire, and I will establish his family, and they will be priests to my anointed kings forever. And then all of your surviving family will bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, give us jobs among the priests so that we will have enough to eat. So, you get, you get the picture, right? You get the picture. That there's these two sons, Hophni and Phineas, and they're just absolute scoundrels. They're absolutely disaster, disastrously treating the presence of the Lord. They are not just taking it lightly, they're taking it to the nth degree and abusing the privileges in the church. And then you have Samuel, which seems to me like, man, this is like the little golden boy of, of, of following God and learning and, and developing and growing in God. Three different times, just in that portion alone, it talks about how he grew in God. He grew in the presence of the Lord. He grew taller. He grew in the favor of the people. He grew in the favor of God. I think that's where we want to be. The next chapter, and I won't go to all the trouble to read it, but this is probably the most famous story of all when it comes to Samuel, and everybody knows the story about, and it's right on the heels of what we just read. So picture this, Samuel is probably a 12, 13, 14-year-old boy, and he's, and he's laying in his bed, and he's serving the Lord, and he continues to grow in his faith in the Lord. And as he continues to grow in his faith in the Lord, something amazing happens one night when he lays down. That's the thing about growth, right? You don't know when the harvest is just all of a sudden going to come. So he's serving God, serving God, growing in God, growing in God, and all of a sudden, bam, God takes it to a whole new level. Says his name, Samuel. So Samuel runs into Eli, and you know the story, three different times, runs into Eli, and he's like, yes, master, you called me? And Eli's like, uh, I didn't call you. Right? And if you read the first chapter, first verse of, of verse 3, it says, the visions were, were so uncommon, and the spoken word of the Lord was rarely happening in those days. But because Samuel was in the sweet spot of growth in the Lord, all of a sudden God spoke to his heart, spoke his name. And Eli, even though Eli's life was a little bit off the tracks as well, He had some issues in his own life. Eli knew enough to go, hey, you know what? God is the one who's calling you. So the next time, the next time you hear your name, Samuel, here's what you do. Here's what you do. You say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. Yes, Lord, your servant is listening. And how, I mean, that's that's a whole, that's an end in the sermon right there. We should all be in the place where we're listening to the voice of the Lord. And so, you know, I would think, you know, your first prophetic word, it'd be great if it's like, you know what? God is going to bless the nation and God is going to, you know, da-da-da-da-da. But God uses this little boy who's growing in the Lord and he literally gives him this message of, you know what? Uh, uh, Eli's house is going to be destroyed and Hophni and Phinehas are going to be killed and all this stuff. And so he's like, oh my goodness, I am so sorry that I said, here am I, sir, your servant is listening. I'm so sorry I said that because this is really bad news. And now I've got to get up and face Eli. 
And so the Bible says that he opens the doors, as was his custom, and he's kind of going through his morning routine, taking care of the temple. And so Eli comes up to him, hey, what happened last night? You know, God was calling your name. And, and so he's like, uh, nothing. <laughs> you know, right? Like, I don't want to share this news with you. And uh, so Eli, Eli presses the issue and says, you know what, I'm going to make it bad for you, and you can read it for yourself, but I'm going to make it bad for you if you don't tell me. And so, so drama beyond drama, this little boy has to stand there to this gray-haired old priest and say, you know what, what you have done has incensed the Lord. The way that you've treated the house of the Lord, the way that you have lived in the house of God, the way that your sons have lived in the house of God is unacceptable to him, and he is going to put an end to it. Can you imagine being that kid to deliver that message at that time? And so Eli, he, he knows, he knows the writing is on the wall. He gets it. He gets it. And so he's like, yeah, I understand. The beauty of all of this, and you know, Eli, is, Eli dies, Hophni and Phinehas are put to death in, in chapter 4. Samuel goes on to continue to grow in the things of God. Because of his heart is in the sweet spot where he's constantly open to the things of God. He's constantly open for what's next in his life. He's constantly, the conditions are always just right when God steps in and goes, Samuel, you need to do this. So you remember the story about Samuel, who, Samuel was the one who anointed the first king of Israel. He anointed the first king of Israel, Saul, Right? And, and God was the one that gave him that word that came out that says, you know, the Lord, you know, he's looking at all these, all these you know, people and it says, you know, th- th- don't look on the outward appearance. It's the Lord looks at the heart, right? The Lord looks, that Samuel got that word from the Lord. Samuel then anoints David. Samuel affects change, affects the cause of all the nation. If you read it, I, I can't remember the verse, uh, chapter is maybe 15 or 14. It talks about when Samuel was on his way out, he's just about ready to, to die, and he gives an address to the whole of Israel. And so his whole life went from strength to strength to strength to strength, and he just continued to serve the Lord, and God continued to use him in amazing ways, affecting the nation, all the way to the point where he's giving his farewell address, and at his farewell address, he's like, have I ever done anything wrong against God? Have I ever done anything wrong against you? Have I ever, I've lived my life to continuously grow so that the glory of the Lord may be seen. When you give yourself to growing in God, God will bless you and God will give you purpose and direction. He'll bless your life. And so oftentimes we ask for the blessing, but we're not willing to do the growing part. We're not willing to put ourselves in the sweet spot of, of, of always growing in God. And I think we need to. And if we did, I think the growth would be unbelievable. I think the growth would be unbelievable in here, in here, and then eventually it would be turned loose. It would affect the nation. Right? So I got five minutes left and I, I, I just want to talk about five things that cause your faith to grow. And we have been through these before and this is a thing I got from Andy Stanley and he said in his uh, message that anybody could take this and use this. He surveyed a number of different leaders and, and he found common threads in stories of people, uh, how they grew in God. So you're sitting there going, okay, you know what? I'm, okay, I'm, 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 I get you. Maybe I have stalled in my growing in God. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not kind of on fire as I should be. Maybe I need to give more attention to this. Okay, I'm in. Okay, how do I do it? Give me the practical. Like, what do I need to do? And so I, I'm going to go off this study, which is basically, this is how other people have grown. They did surveys, and, and uh, this is from Andy Stanley. And these are the five things that will help us to grow. And this is not a list. This is not a to-do list. This is just when people have grown, they point back to these five things. Okay, so Tori's just going to put them up in order. Number one is practical teaching. So that's, you know, that's one of the things that you need to be listening to. That's one of the things at our church that we're going we're gonna to try to get where rubber hits the road all the time, where it actually matters in your life. 
and it's practical. And here's, here's something you can do practically, a takeaway, something that you can do so that you can continue to grow in your faith. There's no sense just listening to somebody, you know, espouse wisdom on some scripture and, and then there's nothing that can actually connect it to the ground. We want to be feet on the ground type of people in our church. And, and you know what, if, if you feel like you're not getting it here, then listen to podcasts. I can give you some suggestions, but this is what we're going to be. This is the direction of our Sunday mornings. We have to have practical teaching. Teaching. But in order to grow, I believe you have to have practical teaching as well. The second thing is this, providential relationships. And um, here, here's the thing. Not, not many people come to Christ outside of relationship. Right? Not many people come to Christ outside of relationship. And, and, and you can probably tell me some stories. Some of you have told me stories about I was going through XYZ and the person came along at just the right time. And all of a sudden, we've been friends ever since. Or all of a sudden, you know, like this and this and, and it all merged together. And there's these providential, there's these relationships. I know that people in this church have, have been saved in small groups. And it was like I was going to the small group just because somebody else invited me or just because somebody else was there. And, and I got saved in that community. Not many people grow in their faith if they're a lone wolf. If you're by yourself, it usually happens out of relationship and that's why we call the sermon Don't Grow It Alone. You know, taking off the don't go it alone. Sometimes we think we gotta just muscle through this on our own. No, that's why we wanna go small groups because God is gonna knit together people and because you're together, you're gonna encourage one another. You're gonna spur one another on. You're gonna learn from one another. You're gonna grow together and all of a sudden you're just gonna be like, wow, this is amazing. God has brought us so far together. The third thing is this private disciplines. You know, there's not gonna be any growth in your life unless you personally are seeking the Lord. You know, we're talking about fasting and prayer this week. You know, Bible reading and, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. Tithing personally, you know, um, silence, solitude, journaling, learning, and all that kind of stuff. You have to put some work in at some point along the way. Disciplines. The fourth thing is this. It's what Derek encountered. Personal ministry. You know, you've been in the place where you're like, I don't feel like doing that. I don't feel like, you know, John, it's probably the first time when you were leading worship and you're just like, me? Seriously? Am I the guy? And, you know, you get up there and you kind of like, you know, feel it's all fumbly and whatever. And then now, you know, you lead us in worship every single week. And uh, so, you know, everybody's had those, those moments where you're standing in front of a class of, of, of teenagers. You're standing in front of a class of adults and you're going, why me? You know, and your knees are knocking and stuff. And then all of a sudden you learn... I, I can do this. Like, I can actually, like, people are actually encouraged. People are actually equipped. People are actually learning something when I'm speaking. And, and you grow, right? Personal ministry. And the fifth thing is this, pivotal circumstances. Pivotal circumstances. This is the divorce. This is the illness. It's the death of a child. It's the birth of a child. It's, it's the wedding. It's, it's, it's hitting rock bottom. It's the loss of a job. It's, it's a new job. It's, 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 it's moving uh, different locations. Pivotal circumstances cause us to lean into God in new ways and help us grow. So my prayer is this week that we would all move into those private disciplines on an increasing basis. That we would make church attendance part of our spiritual discipline where you can exercise personal ministry, where you can hear practical teaching, rub shoulders with one another, Third thing is join a small group and allow those providential relationships to start to take some shape. Meet new people, learn new things. Hey, let me just say this about small groups. A lot of you are saying, you know, I've been in church a long time. And I'm not sure what I'm going to learn if I go to a small group. Well, number one is you might be surprised what you're going to learn. But number two is growth doesn't always happen by taking in. And I believe there's so much wisdom and so much experience in this room that I know as a pastor and a person who studied the Bible and gone through Bible college that if I sat down with you in a small group I would learn something because you have the scars on your back you've been down that road before you've walked all those avenues and so you go to a small group and maybe you don't grow because you're getting something in you're growing because you're giving out and you're in the place where you're all of a sudden mentoring and you're, you're leading and, you're, and all of that. And that's a whole new place for you because you thought, well, who would listen to an old person like me? But there's so much wisdom and experience that is being unused if you don't attend a small group and give in that way. 
church is a, a support system when those pivotal experiences come your way. So John, would you come and lead us again? I just want to say this as we close. If, if you change nothing, nothing's going to change. Right? If you change nothing, nothing's going to change. And so the, the, the struggle today is, okay, God, what, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? And so let me give you some suggestions. If you're not a believer today, you don't believe in Jesus, you don't follow Jesus, your next step is just to say, okay, well, I'm in. What's the next? I, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to learn from his teachings. I want to, you know, move into, excuse me, into some disciplines and all of that stuff. And we invite you to come back and find out more. That's a simple first step if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower. And maybe you are a brand new follower of, of Jesus. Then maybe some of the next steps are for you to get into a small group and get discipled or be baptized. You know, read your Bible with somebody. Get connected with somebody and just say, I don't understand this, but I want to. How do I understand that? And if you've been baptized, you know, get into a small group. Challenge yourself. Allow people in there to, to, um, to teach you. But here's the next thing is, is maybe you need to serve in some way. You know, maybe you, you've, you've grown a bit, but you're kind of like, well, I'm not really doing anything with my faith. Well, maybe you need to serve in some way. You know, come, come talk to me and we can, we can put something together. And you just need to be about serving God and in so serving, you'll grow. John, if we could sing that song um, from the inside out again, just as the ending song. And maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. I mean, the sky's the limit. You know, you have all of this experience and this breadth of knowledge and you can basically take it anywhere. You could lead a small group and you can say, oh, no, not me. And I would say the same thing about Derek at the beginning. He would say, oh, no, not me. I can't even speak to one human being, let alone 800. And I say, yeah, you. Yeah, you. Maybe, maybe what's next is, is God calling you to, to lead some people and teach some people. And yeah, your first couple times, your knees are going to be knocking, your mouth is going to be dry, you're got really going to be confused and not really know, but God is going to honor that. God is going to honor the fact that you're putting yourself out there. You can serve on the hospitality team. You can serve in kids' church and teach some children. You know, we have to, we have to mentor our kids. We have to lead our kids. We have to teach them. You go, well, I don't even know how to teach kids. You know what? There's only one way to do it, and that's just jump in. If you change nothing, nothing will change. And so here's the question that I want you to take away with. Am I in a position where I can hear from God? Am I in a position where I'm going to grow? Am I in a position? Am I in the mindset? Am I open to what's next in the spirit realm? Am I open to what's next in my discipleship process? And that might take some thinking because you may say, oh, of course. And God might say, show me how. How are you opening yourself up? How are you uh, presenting yourself to me so that I can infuse my life in you? Let's, uh, let's pray and then John's going to lead us. God, I can't help but think, what if we all took this step together? how our church will be different, God. What if, what if we did all this together? How our, how our community would be different, how our culture would be different, Lord, spurring one another on. And you're not calling us, Lord, to, to be fruit inspectors, but what if we were all each other's cheerleaders to grow more in our faith? God, there's strength in numbers, and I pray that all of us would be in a place where we would grow more. So maybe today, as you're listening to this prayer, you're, you're on the fringes. You've, you've never taken that first exciting, adventurous step, but you want to. Or maybe, maybe you've grown leaps and bounds in the past, but something happened to your growth and, and you were stopped in your tracks. Or maybe you've just become lax. Maybe you've just become lazy and forward progress and your commitment to God is just something that, like we talked about in the Bible, is being just taken lightly. Or maybe you're just sitting there saying, I am growing, but I'm, I'm hungry. And I want to see the hand of God at work in my life. And I have an appetite for more. Regardless of any one of these places, just pray to the Lord and just say, today, God, I want to grow in you. Today, God, I want to go further to, with you. Today, I want to go further, God. Are you in a position where you can grow? Now, we've mentioned a bunch of different things, and everybody's heads 
bowed and eyes closed. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for people to do something challenging. And you might be a brand new believer, you might be a believer of 50 years, but you've something has struck a chord in your heart today, and you're saying, I want to grow in God. And here's what we're, John's gonna lead us in this song, and we're gonna be gone after this. We'll never get this moment back. But you're sitting there saying, yes, I want to grow. And what I'm, here's what I'm going to ask you to do, regardless of where you are on that faith continuum. I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet if you want to grow in God. Just stand to your feet. So God, for all these people that are standing, Lord, I'm praying that, God, as this is a first step, God, that you will show them what the next step is. Lord, that you will lead them, again, as we always say, in grace and truth. Lord, that you will allow them to know you in deeper ways, in stronger ways, in fuller ways, Lord, so that we can hear your voice, so that, uh, God, we can affect change in our homes and in our communities, God, in our church, and, Lord, that our lives would be different. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this song together and then we'll be done.